I'm joined today by Professor Jim Collins, a professor of medical engineering and science at MIT and formerly a colleague here at Boston University. And I'm going to ask him what he thinks the future of synthetic biology might look like in a post-COVID world. You know, synthetic biology is still a relatively new field. It's about two decades old. And it's an emerging area that's bringing together engineers with molecular biologists to use engineering principles to model, design, and build synthetic gene circuits and to use these gene circuits and other molecular components to rewire and reprogram living cells, as well as to use them outside of living cells for a variety of applications. I think post-pandemic, we're going to see an increased interest in synthetic biology. What we've seen in the midst of the pandemic is a number of groups, including our own, using synthetic biology approaches to develop novel diagnostics, novel vaccines, and novel therapeutics to address the COVID-19 pandemic. Intriguingly, at MIT, what I saw before the pandemic were that most of the young geniuses coming in interested in the life sciences wanted to study one of two areas, neuroscience or cancer, two very important areas with tremendous areas still to be explored. What I think we'll see post-pandemic is the third area, and that is synthetic biology, and specifically synthetic biology as it applies to infectious diseases. And what should we expect from this increased interest in synthetic biology? What should we expect it to deliver? I think in this century, we're going to see two dominant technologies, artificial intelligence and synthetic biology. I think you'll increasingly see young people with interests overlapping life sciences, computer science, engineering, physics, mathematics, chemistry, all converging into this space where we can think about engineering, harnessing biology to address a broad range of the world's problems, including those in biomedicine. In terms of increased interest, I think outside of the young trainees, it'll consist of an increased number of startups, an increased number of established companies, and an increased number of nation states turning to synthetic biology as part of the future and part of the future solutions for preparing for the next pandemic. I think it's easy to say the next pandemic is coming. We don't know from where, we don't know when, but it is coming. We were ill-prepared for the COVID-19 pandemic, but I think synthetic biology and appropriate responses by our communities and our nation states will much better prepare us for the next pandemic. When you talk about being better prepared, what might better prepared look like? What might have it meant had we been better prepared? We, we could have been better prepared, I think, in two major ways. One is having uh, better reserve stores of needed equipment for a pathogen outbreak, be it respirators, uh, manufacturing capacity. The second is having in place platforms that are ready to go, be it the development of rapid diagnostic tests, uh, the deployment and development of a rapid vaccine, and the deployment and development of rapid therapeutics. We were behind on all three of those. I think uh, the U.S. and many of the European countries have done a very good job of ramping up efforts on the vaccines, but have done a very poor job around diagnostics and, and a poor job around therapeutics. So we need, I think, to have public good approaches in order to be so much better prepared for the next one. You talk about these two great forces coming in the future, AI, artificial intelligence, and synthetic biology. Should people be concerned or should we be excited? I, my, my view is that all technology is a potential dual use, broadly defined, and that is can be both used for good and can be used for bad. I think the same holds true for AI and synthetic biology. I would think that we should be more than cautiously optimistic of the great promise each of these areas offer, but that we should be vigilant in keeping track of various groups that they don't threaten rights of humans around uh, the world and that they don't pose unintended dangers or, in fact, intended dangers. And so in each case, they could be used for ill purposes. I think the great majority of efforts in each case will be constructive and for positive purposes. And those should not then be held back because of a very small number. And yet, with a small number, I think we need to do a better job of training our young people and existing leaders of the ethical moral challenges that each of these new areas pose. If you were asked to grade how science has done this time around, what grade would you give? You'd probably give us a B to B plus. I think, I think you've seen much of the biomedical community turn very 
enthusiastically, energetically towards addressing the pandemic. But I think uh, as much as the spirit of collaboration has been there, I don't think we've seen as much as we should. I don't think we've generated and utilized the data as well as we could. I don't think we uh, have coordinated efforts between academia and industry as well as we could. So I think there's been a number of interesting insights published and or posted in pre-publication sites, but very little effort of the innovations happening in academia are being properly translated. And it's that valley, that gap, we, it needs to be better bridged in order to really harness the discoveries that I think have been good. And I would give the discoveries a higher grade, but the overall grade, BB plus.